Hello, everyone. Welcome back. Good evening. Welcome to Spec and Tech number 41. A big applause for everyone. Woo! Okay, so um, if this thing works, okay. Spec and Tech number 41, uh, vroom vroom, uh, with this uh, uh, figura rhetorica that you might uh, know. Uh, we will be talking about cars, uh, racing, and a few connected topics with our first speaker, who's uh, Lorenzo De Matte. A big applause for him. Woo! A big applause. Second, our two speakers, Toto. They are from uh, Eagle team. They will talk about cars and how to win big prices with them. Alessandro ah, Sartori. Ah, Alessandro, sì, Alessandro e Filippo, thank you. A big applause, thank you. It's the first time for me, uh, sorry. Okay, so let's do kind of a game. Uh, can you raise your hand uh, if it is your first time here at Spec and Tech. Okay, as always, like, uh, there's always kind of a part of the room that is, uh, it's my first time, and there's a part of the room that's like, it's my 99th time. So uh, there's something in between, you know? Uh, for the people that who do not know us, uh, we started back in 2016 with these sort of events uh, where we basically gather people around uh, a room. Some of you might spot yourself in the photo. It's this exact space. And then we started with events. We had uh, basically around 40, 50 events. Every night there's a different topic. Every topic is seen from two different perspectives. This was in 2016, and then things went well. We founded the association in 2017. Now it's a, a no-profit association, cultural association. And this again was 2017. We started having this room packed with people. And then we started moving around. Uh, Spec and Tech became kind of a format. And in 2018, we went to the airport in Trento. If you don't know, there is an airport in Trento. And then we went to Muse, to the Museum of Science. Uh, and then we started to organize our Spec and Tech retreat, where we basically go in the mountains uh, and we do shit uh, for a whole weekend. Uh, we party, we celebrate, uh, we uh, go in the sauna, we go to the spa. We walk, we hike, uh, and we talk uh, nerdy stuff. Of course, COVID happened, and everybody knows it. Uh, while we were waiting for the comeback, we also had a podcast. Uh, if you're interested, uh, there are some very interesting events uh, yeah, and talks. You can just uh, Google us, or you find on our website, uh, Spec and Tech Podcast. Finally, yesterday we turned six years old, so I would say a big applause uh, for Spec and Tech. <laughs> Actually, it was the 1st of March of 2016 when we started Spec and Tech. We gathered these, uh, I don't know, nine, ten people in a room, and we said, okay, let's make some uh, tech events, some meetups in Trento, because there are none. And we are still here after six years. Whoa. Even though a lot of things happened. Some of us totally changed their lives. Some of us went abroad. Some of us uh, uh, became uh, parents uh, and everything, you know. Life changes uh, and also the association needs to change and to adapt uh, to these kind of events. So if you, know, if you noticed, uh, in the past few weeks, we also sent out a form. Uh, we had a lot of respondents, so we thank everyone for replying. If you want to do it, you can still reply and answer to this form. And we had... Uh, uh, a few tens of people tonight uh, that uh, actually came before the event and we, they started mingling here and saying, hey, I would be interested in coming and joining you guys. I would like to ha give a hand to Spec and Tech. I would like to be involved somehow. And also kind of to give back to the association. So this was what we're doing. For everyone of you out there, you can also help in other ways and there's a way to support. Uh Yes, mm, uh, if you don't have time to support the, um, the association in your time, or you can do it uh, in other ways. So you can, uh, I don't know, uh, buy uh, some t-shirts, some stickers. Every year we got a new t-shirt. Uh, okay. 
This is the one for the 2020 edition, the stay at home. Uh, it's really cool, buy it, please. We have few, <laughs> yeah. few ones out there, five or six, the very left ones. Yeah. So you can go at uh, the entrance and buy some, someone, okay. Uh, we have also uh, stickers, there's for uh, any uh, years that we have done these uh, events, uh, thanks to TGNate, I don't know. <laughs> Um, if you don't have money with you, you can also donate with Satispay. You have also a promo code, so please donate, donate, donate. You get five euro for free, and then you donate those five euro to Spec and Tech. Easy. Thank you, Satispay. <laughs> so uh, mm, there is also a website, our website uh, uh, on uh, on. <laughs> You can also see the past events. Uh, here is the one of this time. Uh, okay. So if you, I don't know, um, you can't attend to an event, you can also go to the website and uh, see the speakers, all the slides, and so on. Uh, if you would also um, contact us to sponsor the events, uh, you are a business uh, or a person that have a lot of money, <laughs> you can contact us. Uh, to give us some love. Uh, and also, if you have something interesting to say, uh, you can become our next speaker. Uh, also on the website, if you are looking for uh, some jobs, you, uh, you are looking for uh, a new occupation, you uh, can uh, find also uh, some uh, proposals. So follow us on uh, all the social, we are everywhere. Uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, uh, uh, but uh, the most of our communication is on Telegram, so uh, if you're not in the group, join us at Spec and Tech. And uh, one of the most important things of the night is to wear your mask on your face, all the face, so the nose count, remember? And don't uh, we cannot eat uh, inside the room because of the law? Yeah, there's actually one, a very bad restriction that you probably are aware of. But uh, till I don't know, 11th of March, they say, or end of March, we cannot really eat or drink inside a room where an event is happening unless it is a kitchen. So basically, uh, for tonight, uh, the networking part will be still here in the room. But if you would like to have a beer, you can also go outside. Uh, if the weather would be uh, warmer, we might go outside altogether. But it's now four degrees, so we don't want to force anyone to go outside at the moment. Uh, still, if you want the beers, uh, they are in the kitchen. So back there, you can go grab it, go outside, drink the beer, and then come back and mingle with the rest of the people. Yeah. So okay. uh, if you have some question, you can go to Slido uh, with the code SNT41 uh, and uh, write on it all your question. All the question will be voted, and the most upvoted will be asked to the speaker. Exactly. Also, if you don't have any question to ask the speakers, you can still go on slide.do uh, ST41 or insert the code ST41 and upvote the question from the other so you're sure that the questions that are asked uh, are the clever one. Vote, vote, vote. Donate, donate, donate. Finally, uh, yeah, we are ready to start. Let's go with the first speaker. Vroom, vroom. vroom, vroom. And the first speaker of the night is Lorenzo de Matteo. So you didn't change the name. <laughs> OK, so down is for going uh, forwards. OK, cool. Uh, yes, uh, my name is uh, Lorenzo De Matte. I actually have an accent of my last letter, but I usually drop it because it's a mess in international settings. Nobody understands it, and you get funny symbols printed in your cards instead. So yeah, the life international settings. Okay, so um, I studied at the University of Trento uh, quite a lot of years ago, uh, computer science. And then maybe some of you know me because I also uh, have been a teaching assistant for the 
computer architecture course over the years, for four, five, uh, six years, I don't remember. Uh, then I moved on, I uh, worked for um, a software company in uh, Alto Adige, and uh, we launched the Alto Adige Pass. I don't know if you know it, it's a, a smart card that you can uh, use to travel all over the uh, Alto Adige uh, county. And then uh, I became uh, uh, a manager, a team manager, because you know, in Italy, the, usually the way up in the ladder is just starting to manage people and not do anything technical anymore. But I didn't want to. I love tech, I love software, I love to code. So I wanted to go back as an individual contributor and I was able to do that uh, as a, a software developer in a Formula One uh, team. Yeah. I recently moved from the team and now I work for Amazon on, uh, on uh, their website, uh, still as a software developer, yes. Uh, I do not uh, send packages. I do not deliver packages. That's usually what my family ask me when I say, I work for Amazon. Oh, cool. <laughs> do you have a truck? Do you drive a lot? Yeah. So, no. So, uh, I'm no longer working on Formula One, but I did this uh, till uh, some months ago, a year or so. Um, okay. So, let's go on. No? Yes. I jump. No, 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 it's okay. Okay, so uh, Formula One, team of Formula One. Which team? Um, I really can't tell because uh, um, Formula One is a very secretive uh, environment. Uh, they are very obsessed with their secrets. Uh, they have reason to because a secret is usually a competitive advantage. And Formula One is a very, very competitive environment. Having a, an edge, a slight edge, over your uh, rival can mean a lot. I mean, who wouldn't want to be on the up 99% of the people, like the top 1%, okay? So do as best as 99% as the other. Well, in Formula One, 99% means uh, a second, a lap. And the second lap, it's the difference between consistently at the top and consistently in the midfield, so around 10th. Or being consistently in the midf midfield, which is good if you are a smaller team, and rock bottom. So it's a huge difference. And uh, yeah, so everything counts. So everything you will see in the slides or I will say in the talk reflects my own experience, not uh, the opinions of the team. Uh, but I'm sure you are clever enough, and I will give you slightly enough clues to understand which team we are talking about. Okay? So, Ferrari. Ferrari is the sponsor of Formula One, no? It's <laughs> recently. It's very satisfying for me to see someone from a, a, a company in Trento to be very successful in Formula One. It, it, it was good, it was good. When I was working in Formula One, they said, oh, you're from Tanto. Now we have bottles uh, of champagne, of uh, sparkling wine from your region. Could be a clue. <laughs> okay, so next. Uh, come on. Okay, so the second disclaimer. <laughs> Um, it will be kind of an unusual presentation. Um, I don't usually do these kind of presentations because uh, um, uh, they don't use it neither at Ferrari or at Amazon. Oops, right. where? <laughs> um, so uh, with the one you, you saw, it's probably the last of the pictures that, you, uh, that I will uh, post on the slides. And I don't like bullet points, so, so this is one of the only slides that has bullet points. And uh, I'm not sure that the organizer will like me because they said to me, oh, you, you, you should uh, ask question only. Uh, well, they will ask question using the app and you will should answer at the end, but I like to interact with, the, with you. And so I will probably ask questions for 
yes, but I will try to, to, to keep it at the minimum and repeat them. Um, okay. Yes, works. So, what is Formula One? Who knows what is Formula One? Hands up. Okay, so Formula One is a sport. It is a formula. What means formula exactly? The formula means two things. The first one is that it is uh, uh, regulated by the FIA, okay? Usually, usually when we talk about formula, it is regulated by an organism. In particular, Formula One, two, three, and so on, they are regulated by the FIA. Regulated, what means? Well, also formula usually means open wheels. So not GT cars, not production cars, open wheels. Uh, there are two kinds of formulas, the open one and the spec one. Formula One is an open formula. It means that everyone needs to come up with a car that is not a production car. It's not something they buy from someone else. They have to come up with their own ideas. It's actually very complicated because there is a huge rule book that says what you can buy, for example, engines, but also part of the suspensions of their gearbox and so on, and what you can't. You can't buy it uh, from another team or from somewhere else. It has to be an original design. This is to guarantee that uh, the teams are actually putting their own work and it, uh, they try to diffuse the case in which a team is actually racing four cars instead of two because it would be very easy for a team uh, like Mercedes, one of the bigger ones, to just buy a lesser one and run four cars, basically. So you cannot do that. You have to come up with your own idea. So uh, regulations. Regulations are also a key part of the sport. There are some things that are mandatory. You have to use some parts that the federation wants you to use, and uh, the one that you design have to be to follow strictly the rule book. The rule book. The rule book is actually fantastic. I don't know if any one of you have read it through the rule book. I hope not. Uh, it's public, by the way. It used to be um, something that was uh, uh, only accessible to the one working and actually on a Formula One team. But I was able to, to Google it and found it. And it, it, it is great. So the rule book is really complicated and it's really strict in some areas because they are trying to force the design in a particular way. So they let you design the car. They want you to design a car that is unique, but they don't let you to do anything you want. Usually to limit performance so that people don't get hurt because the car goes too fast against the wall, or to limit costs, which has been the driving uh, uh, sentiment in the recent years. So just to, 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 to read a little, I will read it aloud for you. Um, this is about the floor, so the underbelly of the car. And in particular, it's uh, the region at the back of the car that generates a lot of downforce. So the diffuser. So continuity. In an area lying 450 millimeter or less from the car center plane and for 450 millimeters forward this plane CC to 350 millimeter rearward of the rear wheel center line, any intersection of any bodywork visible from beneath, so you can imagine people going and looking beneath the car, um, with a lateral longitudinal and vertical plane should form one continuous line which is visible from beneath the car. I mean, come on, it's really, really complicated. It's about uh, imagining intersection and planes and boxes in which you can put or cannot put stuff. It's very complicated. And one of the things that uh, really works in Formula One is one that is enough, very good at reading the rules, but has enough in imagination to find the loopholes in the rules. Okay, so what about of software? I mean, it's spec and tech, and I'm a software engineer, so we are going to, to talk about software at some point, and this is the point. So how many of you are software engineers here? So computer science, uh, okay, okay. I will try to, I, it's a general talk, so I will not talk about code or anything like that. But I want to present you 
my work, what I did in Formula One. So we are talking about software. So what kind of software? Uh, of course, e every team has its own software, but they are all, all have this very similar software stacks. Um, of course, you have an ERP for um, tracking all the parts uh, that you are commissioning to be produced outside and so on. You have uh, uh, a lot of software about knowledge sharing because inside the team, you can think you have hundreds of engineers, so you have to in some way share drawings, uh, knowledge, photographs, videos, and so on. And you have software for simulation and data analysis and uh, CFT, which is computational fluid dynamic. Why? Because in the recent years, one thing that the, the FIA did to reduce the cost is to introduce not only technical regulation, but also sporting regulations. So you, for example, cannot run your Formula One car when or where you want. It used to be that way. Uh, for example, in, in, next to the, most of the factories, there is a racetrack. So in the past, they just built the, the car and put it in the racetrack. Now it's not possible anymore. You can just run at tests that are approved by the FIA, which is kind of 10 days a year. So you can run your car only at the events, so at the racing weekends, or at 10 days of test. So how can you tell if your car is performing or not if you cannot run it? You run simulations. So the burden of uh, software, of the presence of software in Formula One, has become really huge. Because if you cannot run the car, the next good thing that you can do is to simulate how the car could behave in a computer. So software is really important. OK, here you can see some of the kind of software that are used in Formula One. One that I forgot to mention, and it is very, very important, every team has one, is the strategy software. You know when uh, you're racing, and there is a safety car, and you want to know if you should sp uh, do a pit stop, a quick pit stop, or not, or if it's better to do one pit stop or two pit stop, or uh, if you are going to catch the one in front of you and uh, be able to overtake him. So there are softwares like these and these and these that will display you the status and uh, of the other cars on the circuit, how many laps they did on the tire, where they are, if they are accelerating uh, w um, in pace with respect to your car, and so on. And there are also predictions. What the software, uh, the artificial intelligence software, predicts that the other will do and how their car will behave. Then you have this kind of software with all the fancy lines here and maybe here and here, that gives you a status of the car. That's the area I worked on. It's called telemetry. This is one of the rare pictures I found of the uh, telemetry software that is publicly available. This is what you see about telemetry of a car. You can see data from the sensors telling you every kind of information, brakes, uh, pressure, wind acceleration, how much the, the, the driver was on the throttle, how much he was uh, on, uh, on, the, on the brakes, uh, the steering angle, uh, and very silly things like speed here. It's very typical curve of speed here. Um, OK, so what can you do with this kind of software? Well, one of the things that you can do is compare, for example, you put the trace of your driver against the trace of another driver, or the same driver in a good lap versus a bad lap. And you can understand how they gained or lost at some point during the, during the, the lap or the race. Uh, not only you can compare what your driver did on the track versus what he did at the simulator versus what did the simulated driver in a simulated software. So it's kind of interesting. Yeah, 
what uh, I worked on, so it was vehicle dynamics and simulation, especially telemetry, collecting and displaying all the data. That sounds easy. <laughs> so why telemetry is so important? It is important because, as I said, it is used to in the design phase. Because nowadays, if you cannot run the car, the next best thing that you can do is to run a simulator. And if you can't run a simulator, a realistic simulator with uh, a big cage and a steering wheel and displays uh, 4K and so on, you can, because probably you didn't even build the car yet, you can build mathematical models of the parts of the car and simulate these parts of the car in a realistic environment. What you do is collecting all the data and then using, uh, which is telemetry, data collection, and use them to compare to the, the predicted with the realistic behavior, correlate, understand what is missing, improve your model, and improve your components as well. It is also used for diagnostic. So when a car is, a Formula One car is running, you always have to have the telemetry turned on. These cars are so fragile that it's like they are on life support. A car cannot leave the pit lane if you don't see his vital signs, his telemetry, on the pit wall. So if you, you cannot just let her go because it could break. Uh, and also, it, um, when you use the, the, the telemetry to perform also some kind of predictions, it can help you understand what's going on in the car. So for example, if they can, the signals from the telemetry can tell you if you have a slow puncture, so if you have to come into the pit lane to change your tires before they blow up, or if your components of some components is failing, so diagnostic, and feedback. Feedback, it is, uh, they tell you what the driver is doing. So have you ever seen the steering wheel on a Formula One car? It's very complicated with a lot of switches. So one of the thing is telling them what to do to change the behavior of the car in presence of failure or to improve the performance. And you can actually check the result of these changes by reading back the telemetry from the car. Uh, yeah, so this is a Formula One telemetry system. You have the car and you have a ECU in the car. Um, uh, it's particular, it has this triangular shape. That's a realistic picture. This? You have a point there. Oh, okay. Haha, uh, -ha. great. So, uh, uh, the, by the way, all the components in blue, including the ECU, you cannot choose them. They are given to you by the FIA. Why? Because they want to tamper. They, uh, they, they don't want that you tamper with them. Because they are also using telemetry to see that the teams are not cheating. So if you are going to use only this amount of fuel because it is in the regulation and you can only use this kind of engine which tops at uh, 15,000 uh, RPMs, they are reading it from the same telemetry that the team is reading. So the blue part is actually owned by the FIA. They are the ones governing it. Uh, in particular, these and these parts, which are the ECU and the software talking to the, to the teams at the pit wall, they are provided by the McLaren Electronics, while this one, the infrastructure, is provided by Magnetti Marelli, so Italian. Um, okay, so you have the ECU, you have these systems redundant that transmit data to uh, access point along uh, the track, and from the access point in the track, they go to, into a track side server. Then they split. Some of them goes to the FIA for checking on you. And some of them goes to your endpoint. From your endpoint, they go to the proprietary software. And then in some of the teams, you don't just use directly the proprietary software, but you interface with it. Why you want to? So the red one is what you actually own and uh, what a software developer in a Formula One team actually writes. Why do you want this? Why don't uh, just get what is out of the box? Remember the top 1%? 
having a different software that tells you the information in a different, more readable, more elaborated way with respect to with your um, rivals, give you a competitive advantage. So this is why most of the teams, especially the big ones, don't use what it is out of the box, but build their own solution to just give a little bit more response, a little bit faster, give more information to the engineers and so on, so you can have an advantage. Okay. Okay, so yeah. The telemetry platform then it is that is owned by the team. It's kind of uh, complicated. This is uh, just an overview. Uh, you can uh, uh, use multiple sources, like I said. You can data from the car, from the dynos, from the simulators, and then you aggregate it and you want to store it. From the storage, you can retrieve data from past uh, uh, events and re-simulate them. So, for example, what if scenarios? What if I run with uh, a slightly um, less loaded front wing? Or what if I, I run with a stiffer suspension? And uh, you simulate the same race using the same inputs, but you produce new inputs that are simulated one. Um, you see live data, like the people at the pit wall want to see live data because they want to understand what is happening in real time. And then you feed the strategy bits as well. They need to know this data, to predict uh, when to stop, or if to stop, if you, if you go to the end, and so on. Okay. What it is like to build software for Formula One? Uh, it's a good experience, because uh, software needs to be very reliable. And you have also to understand uh, mm, the timings of Formula One. You have the race weekends, uh, and that's it. There are strict points at which you cannot fail. If uh, the telemetry software fails at the weekend, the car doesn't go out. So if you're missing a qualifier, it's a big deal. If you're missing a race, it's a big deal. So you have to be very, very careful. And you have to handle very, very well the case of errors. So you have to be very strict and uh, have uh, always a plan B and a plan C, probably. But error exists. So if you tell mechanical engineers working in Formula One, uh, how would you like your software? They will say, well, completely bug free. I don't want any error, zero errors. But we all know, well, the SDs, the software developers in the room know that error exists. It's impossible to build software without errors. So what, what you do? You deal with errors. So you build in redundancy a lot. And uh, uh, you have always failovers, plan B and plan C, but also you tweak your process. So as a software developer, you have to do software in a very good and controlled way. You have a lot of tests, and they better be automated. So every time you make a change, you run again the same testing scenarios automatically, so you can run them as many times as you want. Every change, you run, soft, uh, you run tests, software tests. Then you have soft straps, uh, which is uh, feature flags. You basically, for everything you, new, you, new, you introduce, you have a variable that you can switch remotely then to enable or disable a feature. That way, if you introduce an error, it's like you never introduce the feature at all. You just kill it for remotely. You have to be able to do failure recovery, so predict that something will fail, and uh, when, they f when it fails, do something that will be able to recover from the error. But it doesn't fail. Well, you never know. You have to be very careful, and you have to be very um, predictive about uh, which part of the software could present a problem. Little bit paranoid. You have to, be, to enable you to do rollbacks, which means if everything doesn't work, with a click of a button, you have to be able to redeploy a different previous version at the track, also remotely. And you are on call, which means that one of you, one of your team, when a race weekend happens, 
is there. It's uh, watching closely the action and the software to see what is happening. Even if the, the, the event, the race, is in Japan or China, which means three in the morning. But yeah, it's just one or twice a year. And you have to be very careful with your coding practices. I have actually something here. So an example, just an example. I promise it's the only code slide, OK? So here you have uh, this kind of function that you have a map, a dictionary, a hash map, or whatever you want. Uh, a key value map. So you put into a key and you get a value back, okay? Who is familiar with this kind of design? Should look very familiar, okay? So what happens? What happens is that, yeah, you can uh, get uh, something that has 11 as a key, get the result back, and you print it on the output. Is enough, yes? This is not what, what you do in Formula One. What you do is something like that. You have a get that accepts a key and two different uh, responses. I have found the value, here it is, and I have not found the value, and it turns nothing. Why would you structure software in this way? Because here, it's not clear what happens uh, when the key doesn't exist, okay? If you don't have a key here, what is the value? In most implementation, it could be null, but it could throw an exception also. And if it is, if it is uh, something that throws null, probably a line like this will throw the exception instead because you are trying to use a null value. So doing like this will force you, will force to see that there are two possible outcomes in this get. One is I found the value, and here it is, and one I have not found the value. This function will not draw, will not return null, never. And you use it like this. You have the value, you can write it. Or you don't have the value, and you write, I have not found any value, okay? It is a silly example, but it is the kind of uh, structure that really makes a difference. This is one of the best lessons I've learned from the engineers already working there. To structure my code in this way, to prevent errors by rendering the errors impossible to do. Because it is very explicit what the function do or not does. No assumption. No assumption of uh, what happens when the value is not there. Okay? Uh, I have uh, a very long 45 minute, le minute lesson about just coding for correctness. I initially thought, well, I will just give, uh, give this kind of uh, lecture as spec and tech, but then uh, he said, no, it's not really the case, probably. <laughs> okay, one thing that you also want to do is coding for change. I mean, when you write some code, you already think when it is a time to come back and change this. I, oh, how am I going to do that? Which, not, which is not over engineering. We are not trying to predict every scenario because you can't. It is, you predict the fact that the, this uh, code will need to change because Formula One is fast paced and changed. They basically build a new car scrapping the previous one every year. There is very little carryover one year to the other. And the regulation change and so on. So software needs to change at very fast pace also. Okay, what does it fit between the Formula One experience and the software engineering experience? Well, one of the good things is that you see that also other engineers in Formula One and the uh, team in general use good practices, good engineering practices everywhere, also applying not to, uh, to software. So they test one bit at a time, they don't test everything together, it's a very controlled and very, um, well, very engineer, very technical environment. One thing that uh, doesn't really work is that you usually have uh, the development cycle that are not ver very well aligned. Like I said, they basically start designing a new car every year. You don't want to design new software every year, year because you, you cannot, you don't have the the power to just scrap 10 years of development and start again 
and, and again and again. So they don't really think most of the time long term because this is this year car, while when you're planning how to build a software, you want to plan long term instead. Another downside is uh, you see bagged uh, practices applied to known software as well. Uh, yeah, it happens. You, you are applying good software practices in your software, and then other people just mess around with the computers. <laughs> okay, so what was my, my experience? The good part it is that it, Formula One is a sport. So you have the competition, you have the thrill of the sport, you have victories and you have the results. Um, I remember holding, uh, you know when, when you win, they give a, 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 a trophy to the first, the second, and the third driver, and also a trophy to the winning constructor. That trophy goes back to the factory, and you can actually hold it and take pictures with it, and uh, it is a very good sensation. I have a couple of pictures in my uh, photo book and uh, fond memories of that. Um, the bed, it is a sport. So you have uncertainties year over year because regulation change. And when regulation change, you can, they can literally wipe away your entire area. There used to be people in the teams dealing just with custom electronics. Now the old electronics needs to be by by the F FIA because they want, have, uh, they, they want to have a unique ECU. So people designing ECU for Formula One don't exist. Don't, doesn't have, they don't have a job anymore because that job doesn't exist anymore. So that's not ideal. So what uh, Formula One uh, left me? Uh, well, a bunch of suitcases because every year probably they change sponsorship, so yeah, they change everything. So this is my attic, I am full of suitcases, I don't, don't know what to do with them. But also a lot of uh, good memories too. It was great to be part of a team, it was great to be part of uh, this environment. And I have fond memories and a lot of friends still in the business. So that's it, thank you very much. Great photo of uh, Mercedes, I would say. Um, okay, yeah, well, we the pit wall was Red Bull. Ah, okay, it wasn't. <laughs> okay, so we got a couple of questions from um, the people in the audience. You can still upload them if you're interested. Uh, first question everybody is asking, uh, are machine learning techniques used in Formula One? If yes, for what and how much are used? Okay, uh, yes, machine learning techniques are used in Formula One. I am especially aware of two things. Um, mathematical modeling and I would say regression models are used for all the predictive part. So strategy software, where to stop, when to stop, if, the other, if they predict that the other would stop or not based on past behavior and so on. This is one of the area in which is heavily used. An area that was closer to mine, it is instead of deep neural network. You are using neural networks uh, to predict telemetry signals that are not there. So for example, you introduce a sensor this year, a new sensor in the car, and you have directly measurement of something. But you introduced it this year, so you don't have data to correlate from the past year, which is usually not a good thing because you want to know if you perform better. That's why you introduce a sensor the first time, yeah, right? So in the past, you just say, well, the, the first year, we just collect data, and we will correlate next year. Now, instead, they can reconstruct the signal using other base signals based on patterns, so based on neural networks. TensorFlow, usually, it's the big name in the game. Very connected to that, uh, do you use uh, um, um, other things like uh, uh, digital twins? You don't usually, well, 
It depends on what you mean for digital twins. Uh, you have pieces of software that can reproduce the behavior of things that are not there. Because this is usually what you do when you are, uh, you are um, running a, a car of a part of a car on a dyno bench. So for example, you are running just an engine to see how it works. You want to simulate uh, how the other components work. So in that case, yes, they are completely simulated or better, more usually, based on previous data, previous recorded telemetry data. How much different is there between a simulated scenario and a real one? It depends on the scenario or? Uh, okay. This is really difficult to say. What every team in Formula One is striving is to reduce the difference to very, very little. I can say I was impressed at how realistic the simulators are. They are not video games. They're really, really, really on another level. And I'm not talking about graphics, because graphics in the video games is actually better. It is the behavior of the car. Um, can you give us more details on the knowledge sharing software you use? What did you find most useful about them? Um, yeah. That's a good question. I, I think it applies to every software development uh, environment. We tried different things inside my team, and I know that other teams uh, uh, have tried also different things. In the end, we ended up with something that was really similar, uh, really simple, and it is a wiki. Most of the knowledge, but also of the project and the ideas, was done using a wiki. Why? Because Using emails uh, doesn't uh, give you history, for example. Once the email thread is lost in the inbox uh, of the one that communicated, it's lost. So a central wiki worked really well for us. Very yeah. simple, but effective. You told me you were getting flooded by questions and this is what is really happening. So yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> which communication protocol is used to collect data from the cars, um, if you know? Uh, yeah, it is proprietary. It is uh, something that is uh, uh, proprietary of the uh, companies involved. So McLaren Electronics has this proprietary format. Magneti Marelli has proprietary format. So it is not a TCP IP stack. And I cannot tell them. Anymore. And those are the same for the protocols and data across uh, the steering wheel? The steering wheel? Yeah. Um, yeah, well, it is the protocol that you usually use in, the, in cars. Nothing fancy. Come. <laughs> a, a question that is very recurrent is uh, more code for connect correctness lessons learned, please. Do you have any more example to give us? Uh, or do we save it for later over a beer or over a chat? Yeah, I can save it for later and, uh, and over a chat, yes. OK. Yes, yes. No okay. problem. Final two questions. Um, how, uh, first, why did you leave Formula One? Um, well, it was a great environment, like I said. I really enjoyed my time there. Uh, it's more personal, because uh, uh, I've seen in myself that I need to change job after five years. I mean, I get tired, tired in the sense I want new challenges. I want to be more stimulated. So I've seen that in my experience, every five years, I change. I change uh, thing, environment, uh, uh, domain, whatever, language, whatever. I need the change. And uh, for me, five years had passed, and I wanted to explore new, new opportunities. That's why I left. <laughs> Final question. How difficult is to join a Formula One team as a software developer? Quite. It's not impossible. It's not impossible at all. Um, it is quite difficult, especially now, because they really need software developers. But as I said before, also regulations. There is a budget cap now, so every uh, Formula One team
can spend just a fixed amount of money, no matter how they earn or they are willing to spend, they need to spend that amount of money. And software development is included in the budget cap. So you cannot spend m more than that. And they obviously prefer to spend it in mechanical development or aerodynamics or carbon fiber and wind tunnels and so on. So right now, there is no opening in Formula One for that very reason. It will probably change over the year because they have really, really a lot of need of uh, software engineers. But at the moment, the situation is not very good for this reason. Cool. We have more questions, but uh, no time left. We keep some of them for later yeah. over a beer, over the networking part. Yeah. Thanks again to Lorenzo de Matteo. Thank you. And now we hand it over to the second speakers of the night. And again from uh, the Eagle team, what do you talk about? Uh, uh, well, uh, let's start with the basic things. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Maybe some freestyle now, too much. Oh, oh sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, I can do some spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I'm going to present myself since uh, the, the next slides will, will just present well, the two speakers. I am Filippo Rossi. I am the chief technician uh, of the software area in the Eagle Trend Racing team. And my, my colleague here is Alex Sartori. Uh, do you want to present yourself? Um, yeah, I would say I'm project manager of the microcontrollers working here. Um, yeah. Okay. So uh, we are here today, uh, we are very grateful uh, for, for the opportunity to talk about our team. Uh, and so I'll spend a bit of time, uh, uh, sorry, I'll spend a bit of time uh, just detailing what we do and uh, what, is, what, what, what is the team and how we structured, and then uh, uh, we, we will dive deeper in the software. So, perfect. What is Formula Psi? Uh, well, um, as, uh, as Lorenzo explained earlier, uh, we, we take the first part of the name Formula, so that means open wheel, uh, and uh, also means regulations. Regulations, we, we are not under the FIA, we are under Psi. Uh, more specifically, the, 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 the rule book that is published by, by the Formula Student Germany. Um, it's a worldwide competition, uh, and it is uh, directed at students of universities. Uh, so students from a particular university group up, and create, uh, they create a team, and they uh, compete in these particular events that take place all around the world. And uh, they, mm, they, f they, they have the task of building, designing, and uh, manufacturing and building uh, a, a vehicle. So. Uh, the, as you can as you can read uh, in the slide, we, we don't ha uh, do wheel-to-wheel -wheel racing uh, in, in the contrast to, to Formula One. This is because uh, of safety reasons, uh, since our, our monopostos are uh, extremely uh, uh, fragile in a way, and uh, and uh, we we don't have the funding of a Formula One team, so uh, repairs are are from incidents are, and collisions are not like the, the main focus of our team. Uh, and so uh, the competitions uh, usually are uh, just based on uh, evaluating a car in, uh, and its performance individually. So the competitions are divided into three steps, which are uh, the technical inspections, uh, which uh, evaluate the process of design of the car. So um, judges come to, to the booth of our team and ask, uh, ask us some questions about the design of the car and uh, the engineering process and how we choose components and uh, why we choose some particular components over others. And uh, then we have the statics, uh, which are 
like this this particular uh, um, we we have this particular type of uh, um, w where judges uh, come and ask uh, us some some question about the business plan and some uh, some some um, the, the below materials and uh, and the, the stuff that I talked before and then we have the, the dynamic events which are actually when the car drives around the track uh, and uh, and we we when uh, the performance is evaluated so uh, Oops. <laughs> okay, who are we? We are uh, Eagle Trento Racing Team, and we represent the University of Trento. So uh, we compete in the uh, electric vehicles uh, competition, uh, and this is uh, uh, this is not the only competition f uh, uh, in Formula Psi. There is also a uh, combustion engine. Um, competition, and there is also a driverless competition, uh, which, as you can guess, uh, requires no driver, but artificial intelligence software that uh, drives the car. Uh, and we hope to compete uh, in, in that category too. Uh, we have a small division in our team that is dedicated to, 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 to develop software, and we are still in the early stages. Uh, and other teams in Europe are, are already developing some, some great, great uh, software around, around self-driving of Formula Psi vehicles. And our team, uh, which as of now has uh, 60 team members, uh, more or less, is uh, structured in a, in a somewhat of a hierarchy where we have the, the, the team leader along with the chief technicians for each area, which uh, like decide the, the, the general direction of the team. And then we have the, uh, the various sub-areas uh, where, where people uh, work on a particular uh, project inside the, the vehicle. So that could be microcontrollers, uh, as my, my colleague uh, represents here. Uh, our process. So uh, we are students. We are full-time students. So we, we don't have, uh, we, we are not committed full-time to this project, sadly. Uh, because we have uh, university duties. Uh, uh, and so th this particular uh, mentality and way of, uh, way of organizing forces us to, to focus a lot on teamwork uh, and, and knowledge sharing. So, so every year there is uh, a, um, a new recruitment phase where we, we, we try to find new people to come into our team. And so those people need to be uh, work, uh, active and working on a particular project as fast as possible. So documentation is extremely important. Uh, uh, then uh, the, the actual realization of the physical car is uh, uh, completely sponsored by our sponsors, which are managed by the um, uh, economics department of our team. Uh, and we keep relations with, uh, with them, and they provide us with parts directly or uh, uh, experiences in, uh, or, um, some team members going directly into a company and uh, actually manufacturing a product with particular uh, machines, machinery or uh, like tools and stuff. Uh, and we also have financial sponsors, which means that they give us money and we can source our parts from our uh, choosing ourselves. Uh, we develop and produce everything we can in-house. This is very impor a very important core value of the team. And uh, we, we, we really, really uh, love to, to, to dive deeper into the details of everything we do. Obviously, uh, for safety reasons, we need to purchase some, some 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 particular components uh, from third parties, but uh, every every everything from software to hardware to to all the mechanics of the vehicle are, are extremely well well thought out and developed in house. Oops. Oops. Right. So I will give you a brief overview of our cards before we uh, dive deeper into the tech stuff. Uh, so this is Chimera, which is our first prototype. Um, as you can see, it's classic uh, formula style shape. So it has, uh, it's a single seater with open wheels. It adopts a tubular chassis. It's made of steel with 3D printed joints, which is uh, very peculiar uh, characteristics uh, that, by the way, allow the very uh, precise way of welding it. Uh, and it has a uh, much more stiff structure. Um, then to give you a reference figure of its power, we. Um, just to, it, it, it did uh, 0 and in less than three seconds. Uh, so the year after that, um, with a bit of improvements, if this collaborates, it doesn't, uh, came Chimera Evoluzione, 
uh, which is basically the same car with some tweaks to the chassis. And that was mainly because of um, regulations that don't allow the same car to compete uh, two years in a row. Uh, so that allowed us to you know, reuse all the work. Um, it got added uh, an aero package, so it has that uh, rear wing that adds a bit of downforce to the car. Uh, then it had a bit uh, of improvements to the drivetrain, so the battery pack. And um, this car is now not dead, but is being converted to driverless, so that, as Filippo said, um, it's still in an early stage, but we are hoping to compete in that area as well. Lastly, we have... I think we have... <laughs> Finiche, <laughs> which is what we are developing right now. Uh, it is born by, uh, from a complete redesign, ground up. We just based uh, the project on uh, our, an analysis of what went right and wrong with the previous cars. So it still has a tubular chassis made of steel and 3D printed joints, uh, but it has a lot of carbon fiber to reduce weight, weight uh, which was the main goal of the project. Uh, in fact, a rear part of the chassis is no longer in steel, but it's uh, a composite structure that supports all the drivetrain, so the axles and the suspension and so. Um, that allowed, obviously, to reduce quite a lot the weight. Uh, then we are, hoping, we are hoping to integrate a full aero package instead of just the rear wing. We also have the front wing. We have uh, an under tray and a diffuser that uh, would allow us to add a lot of downforce with minimum drag added. And then as we improved the uh, power train once again, the battery pack is redesigned and much lighter with the same efficiency. And also the uh, attractive system has uh, a redesigned gear system. So um, we have planetary gear this time and uh, th they allow for uh, the same mechanical efficiency, but you know, in a much more tight space. Uh, last thing we are, had we are adding is some traction control technologies uh, that will allow to you know, use its wall power. Then the software team, this is how it is organized. So uh, it is in turn a small hierarchy. Uh, the software division is split uh, uh, in this way. We have a microcontroller area where we develop the firmware for all the control units of the car. Then we have an end card workgroup that develops uh, this end card, which is a charging device for the battery pack. Uh, this is again to comply with the rulebook because it is a very uh, critical component, as you may guess. So um, it has to be charged separately. It has to be unmounted from the car and charged in, an in, uh, in a specific area. Uh, then we have a steering wheel, steering wheel area that builds that uh, beautiful wheel, which, as you can see, is not just a mechanical piece to operate the wheels, but it's uh, a complete interface with which the driver can uh, uh, interact with the car. Uh, lastly, we have telemetry. Um, that, uh, well, you already know that, but <laughs> it's, uh, it's essentially logs all the data that we, the, the, the car produces from sensors to anything else. Then before diving into microcontrollers and all the other stuff, I'm going to give you a brief introduction on the canvas that we use, just to give, some, give you some context on what I'm about, what I'm about to say next. Um, Canvas is, uh, if you don't know, a very common standard to use in automotive. It's basically a network uh, with uh, high speed and high reliability. Um, we actually have two networks because uh, with the previous car, uh, oftentimes it would happen that sensors that are operating at very high frequency, uh, such as the IMU, which um, basically reports a lot of data on its linear acceleration and uh, gyroscopic forces, um, they would congest the network, and if uh, priorities are not properly configured, they would slow down other devices and congest the networks. So more important devices such as the inverter would, uh, th it would happen that they would lag behind and not be very responsive. So by separating the network, we are hoping to uh, solve this problem. Uh, second thing about the CAN network is that we have developed this fantastic tool that allows us to centralize the management of the ADs uh, basically, uh, CAN has this uh, amazing feature where messages upon collision uh, don't get lost, but uh, the, the message with the lower ID has the highest priority and it survives. So assigning the correct ID to every device is very important in order to uh, maintain the car responsive uh, uh, when the network is congested. So again, in the previous car, that it would happen that um, if priorities change, 
changed it during, during design, uh, we would have to manually change every ID which was our coded in any unit, and that was a real pain. So yeah, this tool um, will allow to, to do automatically all that. We just uh, edit a central configuration file, and every other project just includes this tool as a dependency, and this provides the serialization and deserialization functions for every message, and that's another problem solved. Uh, so next, these are the microcontrollers that we use. We have two BMS, which are uh, battery management systems. We have one for the low voltage and one for the high voltage battery pack. Then we have the text unit, which is essentially the, the union of two other units. We have DAS, which is an acquisition unit and an ECU that, um, that implements traction control. More specifically, we have the BMSLV, which controls a 15 volts supply, which is a scale to two rails, one at 12 volts and one at 24 volts. And having these two power rails allows us to um, attach high power devices such as cooling fans or pumps directly to the rails. And all the boards downscale the voltage to five volts uh, on board. So this also allows to uh, reduce uh, voltage drops if the rail were to be uh, at already five volts. Then we have the BMS for the uh, high voltage system that is quite more complex. In fact, uh, um, yeah, it's a very, it's much more delicate because it's a battery pack that holds um, more than 400 volts, so it's, it can be little. Um, it, it's a board that performs a lot of continuous error checking and reports its internal state cell by cell. And um, it operates with uh, several boards and not just one. There's a main board which holds the, um, the primary logic, let's say, let's say. And this main board communicates with an internal dedicated CAN to a number of cell boards, which are some uh, slave boards that uh, every module of the battery pack, it's composed of several modules, uh, has one cell board that measures every single cell's temperature and voltage and communicates it to the, uh, the main board. So this main board kind of um, has a complete view of the battery pack and so can um, you know, see if something is going wrong, or et cetera. Uh, then the text unit, as I said, is uh, composed of an acquisition unit, which reads uh, a great number of sensors. So it reads temperatures for the wheels. Uh, it reads the uh, IMU, which is the inertial unit. And it, it reads the pedals values, the encoders for the wheels, uh, for the steering wheel, and many others. Uh, then it operates the, the, the powertrain. So after reading the pedal values, it forwards these values to the traction control unit. And then based on this value, on its response, it commands the inverter. So it, it operates the, the, the actual motors. Um, traction control, by the way, we have three modes. We have slip control, torque vectoring, and a combined mode. So slip control just I know, limits the slip on, for example, on an acceleration event while torque vectoring is much more useful uh, when, for example, cornering. So it, it uh, takes into account also the yaw of the car and the, the, the steering angle that the driver is, is inputting and um, is capable of um, running this virtual model of the vehicle and understanding um, how to, to distribute power to the wheels. So one wheel can receive more power than the other to, to you know, really, um, get the maneuver straight. Uh, another device is the end cart, which, as I said, serves the purpose of charging the battery pack. So the battery pack, just uh, some figures for your curiosity, as I said, is uh, um, more or less 400 volts. It is an 108 S4P configurations, so it's a 28 uh, series and for parallel cells. It has a total discharge uh, of 180 amperes uh, continuum and a total capacity of a bit more than six kilowatts hour. So this end card, um, hardware-wise, is composed of Raspberry Pi, which runs two softwares. It has a charge control software that communicates with the BMS of the, of the accumulator uh, via its canvas. So it can read um, all the temperature and voltages of the cells, um, and this way it can um, you know, plan an efficiency, an efficient charge, charging process, 
and, and also keep it safe, obviously. And second software that the EntCart is running is this web interface that you see to a Python server on Flask. And that is implemented on a REST API, so pretty standard stuff, uh, which, uh, by the way, allows these great interfaces that is, uh, I think few teams have. Uh, next, I will leave you to Filippo, which will tell you about telemetry. Okay, so you you heard uh, from the from the the first speaker about the telemetry in Formula One. Uh, as you can see, we we have the the telemetry is located in our vehicle uh, behind the, the steering wheel, uh, and the here's uh, a, a somewhat similar diagram to to what uh, my the first speaker showed. Uh, uh, we basically, uh, as uh, as we already told you, the telemetry has the the main purpose of logging what's happening in the car. So, the the uh, as as Alessandro told you about, uh, we have this canvas, uh, which uh, is is practically a, a, a bus where messages from each device connected to the it flows. Uh, and uh, uh, the telemetry is uh, somewhat of a man in the middle, which captures every message and uh, uh, keeps the state of the vehicle uh, so that it can be analyzed uh, post-race, post-test, post and, uh, and uh, we can uh, analyze data and conclude if our tests were successful, if there, were some, there was something wrong in the, during tests, and uh, uh, we, we can keep uh, all the numbers in check and, and, and see if there were voltage spikes and, and so on. So, uh, we 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 have this these two main uh, main um, uh, objectives: the one of storing the the raw data and for later analysis, and we also uh, have a, a bit of a live telemetry so that we can have um, a, a real feedback of what's happening in the car in uh, in quasi real time. So uh, this is the architecture that we 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 use uh, uh, around this rectangle. You can see everything there is that is included in the car. So uh, the sensor data, the data from the boards, uh, so the 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 text unit, the the, the BMS, uh, and the GPS on board, is transmitted over CAN to the telemetry, and then the telemetry stores the 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 data and, and sends it in two ways. Uh, it stores the it stores it in a in a raw CAM file, which then can be offloaded from the from the vehicle with USB and can be uh, interpreted with a, with a client uh, outside of the vehicle. And then it can be also sent over Wi-Fi 3G LTE uh, via TCP to a server where uh, a remote client can access it uh, remotely and, uh, and directly. Uh, here you can see that there is a, a somewhat of a parsing layer because uh, keep in mind that this is uh, raw data uh, and doing a parsing inside the car can be costly on a resource level. So we, we try to offload the parsing of the data to, to a server elsewhere. Uh, and, but we also have the, 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 the a new experimental um, layer in our telemetry, which is uh, over the air transmitting uh, uh, via an antenna, which is uh, located inside the vehicle, directly the CAM messages to uh, uh, a base station in the in, in the field where we test our vehicles, and then uh, the, the 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 live feed is much more much faster than 3G uh, or, or where 3G doesn't doesn't exist doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't have signal. We can use a, a direct radio link. But uh, either way, uh, here or here, it, the, uh, the, the telemetry uh, sends its final form into an Influx database. Uh, I don't know if you know time series databases, but Influx is one of them. Uh, time series basically means that every record that you put inside the database is associated with a timestamp. So we uh, can have the logs of everything that is happening on the car with an associated timestamp, and then the database basically stores uh, timestamps in a clever way so that we can have clever storage and of, of timestamps in, in order. And uh, with, with this uh, kind of so storage, we, we can leverage the, the fact that every, every data has a, has a timestamp, and so we can plot every, every single data point in a, in, a, in a graph where the x-axis is, is, a, is a time. So Everything from voltages and and uh, um, uh, uh, well any anything else sensor data uh, uh, is is plot, uh, plottable in, uh, in 
in, a, in, in an easy way with, with Influx. Uh, we also have some, uh, some kind of intelligence software inside the telemetry, which uh, with the GPS data uh, tries to count laps um, done by the, the vehicle. This is pretty useful when we are doing uh, some, some particular tests when we, uh, when, where we try to, to do a, a particular track multiple times. And this lap counter internally without any state, just the, the latitude and longitude uh, of the, the, the vehicle can, uh, can uh, see when, when a lap is, uh, is completed and calculate timings so that we can see if, if there were with some sh configuration changes, performance improvements or not. Uh, uh, obviously, the, the, the part, uh, not every, everyone can interact with the database. We have many, many people in the team which are not coders, uh, obviously. And so we also um, try to, to make this data available to everyone in the team to examine. And so we have a small uh, exporter in MATLAB so that uh, people that wor work in the, the dynamics department in our team can, uh, can interpret the data and, uh, and work with it and design better, better uh, traction control systems later, later down the line. And then we have the steering wheel. The steering wheel, <laughs> if you didn't know, the steering wheel is here. <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, we, we are, this is a key killer feature of the, 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 the our car from the beginning. Uh, we, mm, we also won a prize back, back, uh, back in the days uh, that was awarded to us by, by Lamborghini for best uh, HMI, a human uh, machine interface. Uh, here you can see it running Pokemon, <laughs> but uh, uh, actually the, the 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 main purpose of it is to 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 aid the driver during during uh, the, the during the, the when the vehicle is moving, but it's also used to by by other other team members and engineers to configure the car. Uh, this is uh, a, a, a somewhat of a reinterpretation of the, the the meaning of the steering wheel, since uh, it's not only used to 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 give feedback to the driver and display the, 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 the velocity and timings and uh, uh, battery levels and stuff, but it is also used to, to calibrate stuff. It is also used to, to, to d debug. Uh, this is a, a, an append-only terminal that uh, receives all the data from the car and displays it so that we can see if the device is connected, disconnected, and stuff like that. Uh, but uh, we also have a small GPS tab uh, combined with uh, Google Google data. Uh, uh, we can build some some maps directly into the steering wheel. And uh, under the, the the carbon fiber chassis of the the steering wheel, there is a, a Raspberry Pi, uh, which has a bourbon Linux installation. Uh, it doesn't have a desktop environment with the management or anything like that. It just has uh, a cute um, uh, Qt-based uh, uh, graphics environment, uh, and uh, the steering wheel software is developed in, in Qt, uh, and uh, uh, it communicates directly into the canvas, uh, so uh, it, it can act uh, as a telemetry, like in man in the middle, reading all the messages that are exchanged with the other devices in the, in the car. And uh, yeah, that's basically it. So now we have, uh, we, we have talked about the how, how we do the software and how we structure the team and what is Formula Sci, but I, I, we, we want to give you a small demo of what the car moving, running. <laughs> so uh, we have prepared a small video to show you.
approach it. Thank you very much. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them along with my colleague here. Oh, okay. Uh, yes, we have some questions. Um, the first one, come on, okay. Uh, do you share uh, knowledge with other teams, so, or do you strictly keep your secrets? Uh, do you want to? Yeah, actually, it's a very nice environment because, contrary to other environments where everyone is very secretive, uh, when you go to any event, any race. Uh, it's an awesome environment because every team is walking around and coming to you and asking how you do this, how you do that, and you just tell them because you know that they will tell you, uh, inter yeah, the intern will tell you, and yeah, we, we share a lot, our knowledge. Um, do you have some wiki like the Formula One teams or what? <laughs> yes, <laughs> we, we, we are starting now to, we, we basically uh, uh, have some way of documenting um, our, the, the thing that that we do, uh, because it's uh, since this is a an university project, it, it is uh, also an exam that we can take, which gives us six credits, uh, uh, and uh, that particular the particular uh, way of getting those six, six credits is uh, documenting the project that you did and uh, uh, also um, giving a small like diary of what you did. So the it's a way of enforcing and uh, uh, the, the, the documentation of the project because uh, uh, you have also the credits from university, <laughs> which uh, motivates you to, to yeah. And we have a small wiki wiki that we are using uh, to 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 share our knowledge on the software team. Okay. Uh, who's the driver, or more? Um, that's my question. Uh, how did you become the driver? I mean, you yeah, must be at a certain weight or age. Yeah, we have a dedicated selection for that, just for the just like for the other members. Um, <laughs> this year we went to the go-karts for a selection, and that was not only to select driver. A driver, it was, um, you know, very uh, day dedicated to the team. Everyone raced, and it was very fun. And some of us just uh, said that, yeah, we want to also compete to to be. Uh, evaluated to become a driver, and then uh, a list was uh, was created with uh, kind of a classification for who was best suited and who less, based on many parameters. So not just the timing, but also you know consistency and a lot of other parameters. Yeah, we should note that uh, pilots uh, are not only pilots in in the team. They still need to contribute in other ways. Pilots are just chosen in in from team members. Okay, uh, so very specific, uh, interesting. Um, but how much time do you spend during the week on this project? <laughs> I mean, so much. Anyway. So, uh, uh, as, I, as I said, six credits, if you do the multiplication, like 25 uh, hours, uh, six credits uh, for, for every credit that you do in university. Uh, like, there is someone in the team that spends probably that amount of time every two or three weeks there. So, so this is a, a bit of a, like, there are, the, we, we spend obviously the time that we, we can spend on the team. Uh, as I said, we are, we are full-time students. But uh, usually the, 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 like the bare minimum that we, we see team members around is probably a, a, a symbolic full day that we do where uh, everyone is required to be there uh, every week. But I think it's funny, so you spend uh, yeah. time it, it enjoying it. Yeah, ex exactly. The, 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 the people that participate in the team are actually always present in lab uh, after lessons and stuff. We, we yeah. They become friends. Yeah. I mean, okay. Uh, what does text mean? And in particular, the brow uh, in gray. <laughs> what? The ah. brow. <laughs> brow text. Uh, well, well Around <laughs> here. Yeah. <laughs> That's a kind of inside joke because uh, that component happens to us to have an acronym that is also the, the nickname of uh, one member of the team. And we also say that he's very good, he's an awesome person, so he's Brau. <laughs> Brau. Uh, <laughs> Brau Tex. Brau, Brau Tex. Uh, when we will see uh, the Fenice running. Uh, Street. Well, that's that's a, a, a very interesting question uh, that has been asked to us uh, 
when we started working with Fenice uh, around 2018. <laughs> so we are still four years in development. Uh, there, there have been some delays, COVID happened, obviously that obviously uh, delayed so some, some much of the, the, the components and parts. Uh, we are uh, currently competing in two competitions this year, and we hope to, to bring Fenice <laughs> to, the, to them. Uh, we, we can't bring other cars because cars can only compete one, one year uh, in, in the competition, then they need to be repurposed or, or we need to build another one. Okay, we'll wait. So, <laughs> uh, can you share more details on programming stack and some lessons learned during development of your own module? Thanks. Smiling face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> very general question. Uh, meaning that it would take days to <laughs> thoroughly answer. Uh, what can I say? Um, one important lesson is that. I mean, a lesson that is a consequence of the very fast turnover that we have among members, meaning that a member en enters the team and spends generally one, two years maybe, and then leaves. A problem that we have is that many times you are given a project that has been uh, already started, and most of the time you just have to delete everything and start over again because it's easier than to spend days to understand what has been written. So one important lesson I'd say is, is uh, having started this week that Filippo started, <laughs> because having good documentation is, I think, the number one priority for, for an environment like this, where there's high turnover. Yeah, um, it, I can add to that uh, a really good uh, thing that I learned from like, participating in the team is not try to reduce stuff. <laughs> this is a common problem in, in our team because people come uh, and they, they see the, the, the stuff that has been done before. They look at it and they say, mm, I don't like this. I want to do, I have a great idea. I want to do it another way. And so they change programming language, uh, the, the, uh, code, uh, this platform uh, style editor and stuff like that. So um, generally, uh, it, it is extremely good to have new feedback, new ideas, but we, we tend to lose so much time redoing stuff that is already already working in the team. So yeah, and I'm and I'm I, I've learned this the hard way because I, I try to redo stuff. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So one other consequence would be consequence lesson would be to respect the opinion of people that are there f that have been there for longer than you. Because I mean, when I entered the team, they told me to do some stuff in one way. And I knew that I just had to respect that because, you know, if I had, if I redid everything, I would be in the same situation that <laughs> Philip, unfortunately, had to have found himself. So. And in the end, I think there must be a reason. <laughs> yeah. Of certain decisions. So yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. In fact, it's better to learn before doing something. Uh, one last question, and that's easier, I promise. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> what's the max speed of the car? Uh, that's a figure that we aren't sure about because we never tried because. <laughs> Uh, you know, being a prototype, it's always kind of risky to push it to the highest <laughs> limit. We estimate about 130 kilometers per hour for the old car. Uh, the new car, instead, the speed, maximum speed would be lower because, um, well, we basically um, mounted a bit less powerful motors to reduce, uh, reduce weight because uh, the previous car had very big motors, and we found out uh, with analysis that they were never actually fully used to their power. So we found out that we, I think we, we saved two or four kilograms, and uh, the the output power will be the same in the end. But uh, also reduction gear, we have an higher reduction, so we have more acceleration but less top speed. So I think, yeah, top, top speed is not really a figure that matters in the events that we participate in, uh, because they are, uh, namely, I'll give you a brief list if you're interested. Uh, there's a deacceleration event, so ju that is just pure acceleration, and it is 75 meters. So again, you don't reach extreme speeds. It's just important that you accelerate fast with good grip and good traction control. Then we have an endurance event, uh, which is actually the, the actual, actual laps in a, in a track. But again, it's full of uh, turns, and uh, these rates are somewhat short because you are mostly uh, evaluating the maneuverability and uh, you know other aspects of the car, not just the top velocity. So again, going above 100 kilometers per hour is not really a necessity. 
And then we have the endurance event, which evaluates the efficiency of the car. So again, it's not an event where you really are pushing the prototype to its limit. OK, thank you both for, Thanks for you. the thank talk. You and really awesome work um, thank you. for the videos, <laughs> mostly because it was great. Yeah. Thank, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Thank An you applause. So An applause. OK. OK. No. Not much left, uh, I would say. Uh, night is gone, almost. Uh, at least the hard part, the, the talks. Um, what is left now? Uh, as we said before, uh, apparently because of the law, because of the restriction right now, we cannot really properly offer beers or food or anything else. There are beers, if you want some of them because you're thirsty, it's fine. Uh, they are in the kitchen, we will prepare them, you can get them and drink them outside. We know it's gonna last only for this event. Uh, hopefully for the next event, we will have beers and food again and uh, the sun will be shining and everything, you know. Um, otherwise, if you want, there's also water. The, here, there are the toilets. We did never tell you, but the ba bathroom is over there. Uh, that's it. We will meet probably towards the end of the month or the beginning of April uh, for new events. You can follow us on our social media, on our channels, on anything. We just ask you uh, a favor now. Please, uh, when we will move this here over, and then you will take your chairs. Yeah, okay. And then you will take your chairs and you will stack them here. You just uh, flip them, you know, if you can. And we will clear up the room and we can stay here and mingle and talk to each other and meet new friends and uh, enjoy the night. Okay? Thank you. Good evening. <laughs>